Hello, this is Dr. Tom Gruber from the National Community Rights Network, and I'm here with Kai Hushka, who's the Pacific Northwest and Hawaii organizer for the, the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. We are um, rights-based organizers. Uh, it's a type of activism, type of community organizing, which is distinguished from uh, other types of organizing. And the, the, the two types that I'm familiar with in my lifetime are uh, trying to work within the system, and, uh, and in our work, we're actually working outside the system. Uh, Kai, do you have anything more you could add to that? No, I think it's a nice quick synopsis of sort of the general framework of what's happening across the country, including in the Northwest. Thank you. Um, so Kai, we've uh, touched base uh, maybe an, a year ago about what's going on in the Pacific Northwest, and uh, and we just talked briefly about some of the things that have historically happened in Hawaii. Uh, and uh, so what we find is that there's a, a, a buildup of organizing. Sometimes these things get met with uh, uh, resistance from the state, the corporate state. And uh, uh, these things temporarily shut us down, but also contribute to our narrative uh, that demonstrates that, uh, uh, that basically the, the establishment is not at all interested in anything that has to do with rights. They're mostly interested just with uh, corporate property and, and corporate um, uh, profits. Um, uh, could you talk a little bit about what's going on? What are the highlights there? And also some of the historic things that are, have gone on in, uh, in the Pacific Northwest and Hawaii. Yeah, sure. I can give a kind of a recent update of what's been transpiring. And I think the biggest thing to remember, I think, about this work is it's it's not it's it's not a straight line. So there's uh, the A to B to C to D sort of movement that we would love to see because on you know on paper it, it's you know it's clear where we want want to go. But you know the movement, the progression, the evolution of it all is definitely more like a maybe a zigzag or a you know movement back, movement sideways. You know things pop up in a different place because of activities. Um, in another place, so uh, it's hard sometimes to talk about you know progress and wins in a sort of straight line method, as I think people have sort of been convinced that um, we should expect. And I think this work uh, obviously takes a very different viewpoint of of how it's going to move. And the Northwest is an example of that. So you know over the last year. Um, really the largest majority work has been in the state of Oregon, uh, most recently with two ballot measures on um, the May ballot in Oregon in two different counties. So uh, a lot of the work happening in Oregon right now is all county-based. Uh, so the issues of which the folks are dealing with are not contained within a municipality, uh, but are happening across their county. And so the organizing has been on a much bigger geographic level, and for Oregon at least, you know, much bigger population base. So it makes the organizing, you know, more difficult than when if you're in a smaller area. Uh, so the recent ballot measures in Oregon have been dealing with fossil fuel use. Uh, so there's a uh, proposed uh, LNG pipeline and export terminal for uh, uh, Coos County, Oregon, uh, which is a place called Jordan Cove. And Jordan Cove has recently gotten national press because it's being talked about uh, as really the the next uh, fossil fuel industry exploit that they would like to see come to fruition. Uh, it's being talked about in the realm of FERC, being talked about in the realm of the Trump administration. Uh, so it's made the, the national map uh, because of the interests of the fossil fuel industry. Interestingly enough, in, in our work, uh, that gas would come in part from the Rocky Mountain Range. So folks in Colorado who've been fighting the fossil fuel industry from the extraction end of it uh, would be very literally, literally connected to the transportation side of it with the folks in Oregon. Um, <clears throat> and as we've also seen in other places, Colorado included, uh, we've seen a, a tremendous amount of opposition formulate from the corporate interests against uh, the measure there in Coos County. In fact, uh, we believe, meaning the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, it's the largest amount of money spent ever in a single campaign uh, fight. So. The corporate opposition there has spent about $1.3 million in a county of 60,000 people to kill the measure. 
and they were successful, unfortunately, within the vote. Um, but as we also know, uh, lots of things got revealed in that process, uh, including, you know, how the corporations will do what they uh, want, basically, to get what they want. Uh, and I think that's uh, ticked a lot of people off to see that much corporate power wielded in a fairly quiet, sleepy community. Uh, and I think it's got some people asking some deeper questions around, well, who is deciding what happens in our community, which is really the, you know, the bare bones we want to get down to. And so the campaign was able to, to pull that more to the surface, even though the wind didn't come at the, uh, at the ballot itself. Those folks are going to continue both for themselves as well as understanding they are connected to the folks in Colorado. So I think that unity stuff, um, especially through fossil fuel projects, is, is starting to grow. And I think that's a strength. Uh, just a, f a little bit up the coast from Coos County is a place called Lincoln County, uh, which is another coastal community. Largest uh, city there is Newport, Oregon. And uh, like a lot of Oregon uh, communities, counties, um, heavy amounts of timber has gone on for, for quite a long time. Common practice today is really utilizing clear cutting, especially on private land. And then administering lots of pesticide applications to kill off uh, vegetation as well as animals from competing with the commodity crop trees. And the common practice is aerial spraying of pesticides, so helicopters in large part flying over, you know, administering large doses uh, and multiple applications over the years. Uh, and the stuff they're spraying is basically the equivalent of Agent Orange. I mean, it's highly toxic highly damaging to people in the environment, yet it's legal in the state to do this, as we've obviously have talked and you've talked to other people in other parts of the country. We have this mechanism of which these kinds of harmful practices are legalized and basically provide the battering ram for the corporations to enter our community uh, against our will. Uh, so uh, in Lincoln County, they formulated a rights-based ordinance of freedom from aerial spray uh, pesticide ordinance. Uh, ran a campaign against the timber industry, also largely outspent, like the folks in Coos County. Uh, but they actually prevailed. Uh, they won uh, their vote uh, about a week and a half ago. However, the vote is close enough that there is more than likely going to be a recount. Uh, there's also a couple of outstanding ballots where people forgot to sign. In Oregon, they do the voting by mail-in ballots, so you don't go to the poll, you, you mail in your ballot. And so it's not official yet, but it looks like they're going to prevail. Uh, and so the next phase will be potentially set up around, you know, will the county uh, enforce the laws that people wanted to see happen? Um, you know, will the timber industry respect the law or will they come after it with, with lawsuits, as we've seen uh, in other parts of the country? So the next phase in some ways of the work is going to start taking place in Lincoln County. Um, as others have seen, as these local efforts can materialize, as the clashes become more visible, uh, others begin to take notice, whether they witness, whether they participate. Uh, but these two local campaigns really stirred up a lot of interest, a lot of uh, sort of wait and see, as well as a lot of roll up the sleeves actions from not just community rights folks, but actually other statewide groups and local groups. Uh, have started to really pay attention to, you know, some aspects of the deeper questions here. And so that's really helping, I think, drive perhaps a new, um, a new environment there in Oregon around sort of expanding the movement uh, to, to the next level. So folks in Oregon, like in Colorado, have filed a state constitutional amendment for the right of local self-government. Like Colorado, they're locked in the courts at the moment because of the state's interference. Um, thankfully, uh, a lower court judge has sided with the community rights folks in defense of the amendment that it meets all the requirements and even went farther than that by really talking to the whole notion of direct democracy and the protection of it from a freedom of speech standpoint. Um, so I've got a very, very good, uh, decision from the lower court judge. The state has now appealed that. So it's probably going to go and be a while before an actual decision comes out in that battle. Uh, but because of the local organizing in Oregon over the last, you know, year, two, three, four years now, and more so in the last year, uh, it's really opened up again a new environment for the work. And so it'll be interesting to see if new community level organizing begins. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if there's more of an actual network and coalition that starts to come together on the state level stuff. So there's a lot of activity in Oregon. I think there's a lot of new potential. Uh, the folks there have been stalwarts for the last three, four years, in some cases running into 
the corporate state system almost immediately and still sticking with it. So uh, Oregon has really been a, a beacon of sorts, I think, for the community rights work nationally. Uh, and the interesting thing is, as I mentioned at the beginning of the work, is these the movement isn't a straight line process. You know, Oregon in large degree owes its existence to Washington State. <laughs> So even Washington State has had you know, large difficulties in the sense of uh, blocking ballot measures from even being voted on. Uh, it provided really the platform for Oregon folks to begin their organizing on, even without uh, sort of the, the marker success that we would like to see happen uh, in Washington State. Uh, it's because Washington State did what they did that Oregon really has the kind of uh, robustness they have today. Um, so in Washington state, as you mentioned, you know, there's been some difficulties in the sense of trying to get things on the ballot. Um, you know, the corporate state really has flexed its muscles and even convinced the Washington state Supreme court to basically relegate local initiative process to that of a privilege, uh, versus state initiative profit processes, which are still considered a right, uh, which means there's very limited uses of what local initiatives can address. Uh, and the biggest uh, problem that came out of that Supreme Court decision was that anything you put forward is going to be analyzed for the substance of what it contains. So if you start proposing things of which the community rights work is doing, which is really calling into question the various moving parts of the corporate state itself, well, as we know, the current legal system is going to take issue with that. And so in Washington state, that basically has left these local initiatives very vulnerable to attack once they're qualified to be on the ballot, because the corporate opposition can merely point to the various existing conventional legal system and use that to deny the people's right to actually vote on something. So it's very difficult to build momentum when the system interferes with even the question itself being out to the public to, to weigh in on. Uh, however, um, things in Spokane continue to progress as well as in other parts of the state, regardless of that decision. So I think that level of defiance that we've seen materialize not only in the community rights frame, but also in the direct action frame is also here in parts of Washington state. Uh, so in Spokane, for instance, despite that ruling, uh, they have moved ahead with a right to climate initiative, very similar to the one recently adopted in, uh, Lafayette, Colorado. Uh, they've also had folks outside of the community rights world uh, begin to organize on a direct action front, uh, physically actually putting themselves in way of the fossil fuel trains that come through Spokane. Spokane's a major hub for coal trains as well as crude oil trains. Uh, in addition to that, CELDEF is involved in a federal lawsuit, a proactive lawsuit against the federal government for denying the people's right to climate and the right to local self-government. Uh, so that case is actually going in front of the courts um, this summer. Uh, the direct action cases, uh, about six people were arrested last year. They have a trial also this summer on the direct action side of things. So things still continue to move and be very much out in the forefront here in Spokane, despite what the courts may have said around the initiative process. And then lastly, to, to kind of finish off sort of an update since we last talked, uh, we have folks now in Bellingham, Washington, and folks may who've been around this work may have heard that name before Bellingham actually moved a community rights ordinance back in 2012 to uh, ban coal trains from coming through. So the coal that was coming through Spokane would eventually make it through Bellingham and to an export terminal at a place called Cherry Point. And so the folks there mobilized, put a community bill of rights together in defense of the people and the ecosystems and ban those trains. Well, they were one of the first or amongst the early uh, community level uh, work to be challenged by not only the railroad industry, but by their own city government. So as soon as they qualified it, they got challenged. Um, the, the courts agreed to keep it off the ballot. And that sort of collapsed the organizing in that community because I think the folks had a certain sense of what would happen. Uh, they felt what they were doing was just and right. They had spoken to their city council people and I think had a, a degree of a false trust that somehow they would come to uh, defend the people's interests. Uh, what they saw was the complete opposite. Uh, to their credit, they've sort of risen from the ashes and uh, have reformulated themselves largely now on a platform of rights of nature. So they're looking at um, Puget Sound, which uh, is also called the Sailor Sea, uh, looking at actually perhaps moving um, rights-based law forward within not only their community, but hoping to get other communities along that waterway 
uh, to move very similar ordinances in defense of the right of that uh, sea to exist as well as people's connection to that sea. So um, again, it's always interesting when you get to step back from the work a little bit, see how it materializes, see how it moves, um, that you know there are always these pockets. And because of course what we are ultimately looking for is those pockets eventually to come together in greater force to be what we need to change the larger dominant system. Um, but I don't think writing people off or writing communities off because they run into a wall at one point uh, is wise, uh, as we see people continue to move ahead and continue to make uh, the right kind of noise and the right kind of impact, uh, whether it's Washington State or, like I said earlier, you know, the amount of work happening in, in Oregon today. And Hawaii is also uh, another sort of uh, case of you never know where it's going to spring up after it feels like it's... Um, you know, been snuffed out. So we had begin work uh, probably also around 2012 till about 2014 or 15 or so. Uh, we work with communities on the island of Kauai, island of Maui, uh, the big island, which is Hawaii, uh, all around GMOs, uh, whether around the GMO seed in specific or the pesticide use that goes along with that type of um, so-called food production. And it was a very big, uh, in that period, not only in the Hawaiian Islands, but also in the state of Oregon, it was very much out there in the mainstream media. It wasn't just a activist focused sort of issue. It was very much being spoke about in all kinds of circles. And so you had communities, you know, rightfully so, wanting to address what they thought is a, a threat and a harm to themselves, to the ecosystems, to the other critters that rely upon, um, you know, healthy air, water, soil, and so forth. Uh, and so in all those places, you know, they were looking for, I think, solutions, looking for answers to address what they thought was a very clear problem. And so we started working with community groups on all those various islands, uh, trying to get them to understand that it's not just a GMO issue, it's not just a pesticide issue, but you have a legal governmental issue, you have a structural issue, a systems issue. And so you can't really deal with the issue of GMOs without dealing with the issue of the system itself. And we made some pretty good, um, I think, traction and headway with folks on, you know, getting to understand that. Uh, but then there was this sort of mental roadblock with pretty much every group that um, I think there was a sort of assessment that what we were saying made sense, but it just seemed so massive, so monumental, so difficult and also begin to just sort of explain it to themselves well we know we need to do that but we'll get to that later and so eventually the community rights uh, framework got sort of pushed to the side and folks sort of took a, what they thought was a, a clearer straighter path to their problem um, just because they thought it was more tangible for them to organize within and so in Maui being probably the best case, you had a, a group that uh, moved a GMO moratorium forward. Uh, they did it by citizens initiative. You know, to their credit, they got the signatures. To their credit, they won a, a very contentious campaign, you know, and got their law adopted. Well, uh, as one would may expect, the industry wasn't going to take kindly to that law, and they took them to task by, by suing the county. And eventually, uh, you know, also lawsuits came out in whole, uh, the Big Island, where actually their county council had put forward uh, restrictions on GMO production. And on Kauai, it was around pesticide use, uh, not really much about banning or prohibiting it, but uh, increasing setbacks and requiring certain disclosure laws around pesticide use. Well, all three of those cases were basically bundled together. All three of those cases faced the federal judge. All three of those cases lost. Um, purely on the standpoint of, well, you are preempted. So there's a higher government body, uh, in this case the state, that preempts you from acting in that manner to say no to GMOs or to actually have any dictatorial power around setbacks on pesticide use. And, you know, once that had happened, um, you know, which has been, I think, almost a year and a half, maybe almost two years now, uh, there's been almost zero, if not zero, organizing that has taken place upon that issue. It has just sort of crushed, crushed the sen sentiment that they can, the people can do anything about it. So people have sort of been scattering in different directions, you know, trying to get the quote unquote right people elected, trying to find other means, you know, working around the system itself, as really their all their laws were doing anyway. Those they were a little bit more direct. 
uh, you know, are all things that we told them would happen. It's all things we, you know, not that we're sorcerers, but it's fairly easy to predict what would happen. Uh, and it's unfortunate because it, it doesn't create the right foundation for the work to move forward, even when you know you're going to run into the barriers that you're going to run into. So there was a lot of lost opportunity uh, around the organizing, both for the issue itself, but also to change the system. Uh, but interestingly enough, uh, the folks that were involved in the Kauai work, uh, a couple of them have sort of, again, risen to the surface, primarily on the rights of nature. And more specifically, uh, a few years back, we've developed these conservation easements for private property uh, holders, landowners, uh, to actually institute rights of nature within those property deeds. Um, so basically, within a conservation easement, sort of dedicating a chunk of land to be conserved in a certain manner in a more natural way, actually instituting a rights-based framework uh, within those property deeds themselves. And so uh, one of the people heavily involved in the Kauai work is now fairly close to actually making that uh, a reality. And so moving the framework of rights of nature, at least within these private land holdings, uh, has also begun now, and at least on the island of Kauai, to spark the interest of a few other landowners. So uh, it may be that, that eventually these private actions uh, eventually lead to more public actions in the organizing and the lawmaking work that really needs to happen. Uh, so it could be that Hawaii finds a different path to this work than they did the first time. So uh, again, I think there's potential there. There's ripeness there. It's sometimes, I guess, it's a matter of timing and learning and understanding. Uh, and so, uh, potential still exists. And right now, it's manifesting within these rights of nature easements on the island of Kauai. Thank you.